I want to welcome you to this uh, 2020 Alexander Thompson lecture. The Reverend Alexander Thompson was a uh, alum, a PTS graduate from uh, 1909. And his widow, Mrs. Lorana Thompson, endowed this lecture in honor of her husband. The lectureship must deal, uh, according to her request, with some aspect of the Bible. So it's a fairly broad category. <laughs> Could fit a lot of things, uh, so that's good. Interestingly enough, the other stipulation is that the lecture should be held as close as possible to Reverend Thompson's birthday, which is March 6th. So we hit it right on the nail this year. It doesn't always happen, but uh, so that's, that's a good omen. Um, the lecture is selected by the faculty of the seminary, and so uh, we are uh, delighted to have our lecturer today. We welcome Dr. Juan Hernandez as our 2020 Thompson lecturer. Dr. Hernandez is presently professor of biblical studies in the College of Arts and Sciences at Bethel University in St. Paul, Minnesota. He received his BSB at Valley Forge Christian College and MDiv and THM from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary and a PhD from Emory University. Uh, he, uh, though, is a native New Jerseyan, just learned, so he grew up in Camden, New Jersey, so we want to welcome him back home to New Jersey. In a recent interview, Dr. Hernandez traces his love of scripture to his uncle, who inspired him to explore and memorize thousands of Bible verses. This gift for memorization, as well as his bilingual upbringing by Puerto Rican parents, helped him develop his gift with languages. He is the author of uh, several volumes, the author of uh, a book uh, entitled Scribal Habits and Theological Influences in the Apocalypse, and a co-editor of a volume of ed essays entitled Studies on the Text of the New Testament and Early Christianity. And he is also a co-editor and translator of an important monograph in German by Josef Schmied, entitled uh, in the English translation, Studies in the History of the Greek Text of the Apocalypse, the Ancient Stems, 2018. And it's this latter publication that Dr. Hernandez will draw on this afternoon. His lecture today is entitled, Recovering Revelations Forgotten Textual History. Joseph Schmid's magnum opus for the 21st century. Dr. Hernandez has extensively studied uh, Professor Schmid's landmark publication on the textual history of the apocalypse, the book of Revelation in the New Testament, um, uh, with the title Studien zur Geschichte des griechischen Apokalypse Textes. For more than 60 years, this uh, Joseph Schmid and his publication on the Greek text of the book of Revelation was the benchmark for understanding the textual history of this last book of the New Testament. Schmid's uh, book on Revelation was long out of print, uh, which made it challenging for scholars to study Schmid's scholarly findings. Today, Dr. Hernandez will emphasize the importance of Schmid's scholarship to understanding this fascinating book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. He will introduce the theories, methods, and materials that support Schmid's scholarship and suggest that Schmid's work remains relevant for today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Juan Hernandez. Well, thank you, Dr. Olson, for that wonderful introduction. Had I known you would spill the beans that I was from Camden, I would not have said anything. I might <laughs> rescind the invitation. Um, so thank you to you and the Biblical Studies Department and uh, Dr. Barnes as well for the invitation. Um, it's obviously an extraordinary honor for me and a privilege to be here, uh, especially since uh, I get to talk about something that uh, has been a labor of love, uh, an inexplicable labor of love, uh, uh, especially with is someone, you know, a German from the 1950s, a priest, uh, and a very obscure textual critic. Um, before I go into the lecture, I just want to give you just a little bit of, of background of how this came to be. Uh, I've heard Schmidt's name uh, since the early 2000s when I got interested in the book of Revelation, and in particular doing textual criticism on the book of Revelation. 
Uh, Schmidt was the go-to person. And uh, the problem with that is that his work is entirely in German. Uh, so even if you are a PhD student who had to take your German exam and, and whatnot, you're just not going to breeze through it, right? <laughs> and so there's a, a really high kind of learning curve, you know, to, to, to get to the work to understand it. Uh, there's a little bit of an irony, though. Uh, because Schmidt had done such accomplished work, I mean, it was a magnum opus, it took him 25 years to accomplish, people really felt that he had answered all the questions that needed to ever be answered or asked, right? So when I was originally looking for a dissertation project and, and you know, one of the, some of the responses were, well, Schmidt answered all of the questions, right? It's 1955 that he published this, right? I mean, at the very least, the questions have changed, even if the data is the same. Um, so fast forward, I, I did work with him, uh, you know, wrote a dissertation, got it published on and on. Well, in 2012, um, I returned to Schmidt, and uh, for some reason I had wanted to go back more in depth and figure out, you know, what he was all about, and I spent an entire summer working through his text, and, you know, just translating it, just nothing else to do, right, and um, I discovered a, a major dating error in his assessment of the textual tradition. Uh, the people who have studied Schmidt know that he argues for these four major text types in the book of Revelation and that they all go back to the fourth century. That's gospel. Any book on Revelation, any commentary, they will all tell you four major text types, all fourth century, ask no questions, look at Schmidt. Even the Nestle uh, Greek text, uh, if you go to the beginning where it talks about Revelation, it's like, see Schmidt, right? That's it, <laughs> right? So even the Germans had kind of said he did it all. And... Um, so as I was going through his work, I realized that uh, one of those traditions uh, was based upon corrections in a manuscript. Those corrections are widely known to be 7th century corrections, not 4th century corrections. He had pegged an entire tradition to the corrections on his 4th century manuscript, but those corrections are later corrections. Because you may have a manuscript like Codex Sinaiticus, which is a 4th century manuscript, centuries later to come along and they just work through the whole thing. Those later corrections were the beginning of what he called this Andreas text type, but he pegged it in the 4th century. That was in 1955. For 60 years, people have been quoting that, right? All fourth century, Andrew Caesarea, and we're talking about people, uh, names in, in, in the field. So when I found it, I was like, I couldn't believe it. And you know, I, you know, I'm not a native German speaker. I'm from Camden, right? What do you know? I speak Spanish and English. It's impossible. Uh, you know, but I did my homework, and so I started emailing German scholars that I knew. I'm like, hey, you know, I think I found this. What do you think? And they were you know, a little cagey with me, and they're like, well, you know, we should do the exegesis, and we should check it out. But, you know, you know this, is their, this is their terrain, right? And I was this ghetto-born Puerto Rican out there just saying, hey, you know, I think there's a mistake in your, your magnum opus. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was a, a Dutch scholar who said to me, Dirk uh, Jonkind, he's a, a well-known textual critic, uh, Dutch, and uh, he said, no, 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 Hernandez, uh, uh, you, you are not wrong, Schmidt is wrong. So that was like the first indication I got that I had found something. So I went to SBL, this was in Chicago, where I had already planned to read a paper on Schmidt, and I was basically just going to say, well, there are different questions today, so let's ask those. And all of a sudden, I was going to unload and say the guy uh, actually made a pretty big error. If he had not pegged the entire tradition on it, it would have been a clerical error right? Fourth to seventh century, well, that's a number, right? But he said, nope, these corrections have the same kind of textual complexion as this later tradition. So that tradition goes back to the fourth century. It was very nice, but it was wrong. So uh, I delivered the paper. I got an on-the-spot invitation by the German scholars who were there to go to Germany, all expenses paid, and see, we got to hear more of this, right? So I went over there. And long story short, it got published, it became kind of like a new look at, at Schmidt, a new look at the dating. Uh, within a year, that article was being cited by other articles. Uh, but in my mind, the real question was not, I mean, great, you find that and you, know, you, you, you get a little, a little peg, right? Um, the work is still out there. It's a 251-page work. And uh, it is an extraordinarily complex, important work of 25 years. This guy's no dummy. And he, he worked. Uh, based off of other German works that were never translated either. Uh, one of which, actually this one was in English, took 30 years. So his work represents, you know, 55 some odd years of, of scholarship that is not being looked at. Now there's still text critics running around and people talking about history and all that kind of stuff and we've moved on in so many ways. Different questions. 
do we not need to understand this though, right? That was kind of my thing. So I essentially decided I wanted to translate the work. And uh, just like with the dissertation, it was no, 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 no. Nobody cared, nobody was interested, the work was out of print. Schmidt, of course, was dead, right? And um, had the publishing house from which it came was defunct. Um, you can't translate a work until 70 years after the author's death. I had 30 more to go, right? <laughs> and uh, so I had approached some German scholars about working on it and uh, you know, they're all older scholars and they're busy and they're like, no, no, no. And they, they almost thought like I was reinventing the wheel. Like, why do you want to go back to that? We've got newer methods and technology and all that. We don't need to go back. And I said, you know, this piece has not been part of the conversation, right? Uh, you know, how many times has Augustine been translated? Why? So he can be part of the conversation. Should not this be part of the conversation? Nobody's reading it. And uh, I ended up finding two younger scholars. Uh, who would go on this fool's errand with me. One was a postdoctoral student in Germany working on the Aditya Critica Mayor out of uh, Germany where they're producing a new text of Revelation, an insider, and a German PhD student. So German, his English is broken, right? Uh, and then there was me who had already done the whole translation from my personal use. And we started working it and working it and working it. In a year and a half, we had translated it in its entirety. Uh, SBL Text Critical Series was interested in it, but we had no copyright. So uh, Bob Bowler, some of you may know the name, uh, sought out to find the copyright. And after a long search, he found one guy who held it. Because obviously Schmidt's dead. He was a priest. No children that we know of, right? Uh, he found one guy in a monastery who happened to possess it. And he gave it to us with his blessing. Just said, here you go. And then it was published. It was just, I mean, so, so it was like, I couldn't believe it, right? Uh, and, uh, and then on top of that, as if that weren't enough, I didn't mention this, we found a, a box uh, uh, that had like, there were like, I think like seven boxes in a uh, Munich uh, library that had his personal effects, uh, one of which was his own book with his corrections. So we were able to incorporate his corrections, right? And so it was really, I mean, it's just kind of, I can't believe it. Like he's obviously looking at me somewhere and, and stuff. So, uh, so that's kind of the, what happened here, that's uh, Schmidt right there, real looker. Uh, there's the uh, original work, and then there is the, the translation. It's more than just the translation. It is essentially, um, there's a critical introduction that goes through the history of research. Uh, we annotate it, and we even include an appendix with corrections uh, to it. And the two guys, I couldn't have asked for better young uh, colleagues because they were young, full of vinegar and spit and all that. And, and they want, you know, and I, when I lured them in, I was like, hey man, if you join me in this, you will be immortal, right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even believe that, but they believed it. And so, so there it is, and it was published. And so, um, you know, uh, uh, just a, a historical artifact, as it were. And so what I'd like to do today is really just kind of take you through the importance of Schmidt, what, what we found, what it's about, what I consider groundbreaking about it. And um, you have a handout you can follow. It gets a little technical, but uh, perhaps the handout will help uh, uh, with that. So, so Schmidt, okay. So Joseph Schmidt's studies of the history of the Greek text of the apocalypse has stood without an English translation for over 60 years. Published in 1955, the work was hailed as a groundbreaking achievement that commanded near universal assent. The situation remains largely unchanged today. The passing decades have produced no rival. The publication and recognition of the work, however, are accompanied by a notable irony. Despite universal approval, the field of textual criticism has shown little, if any, serious engagement with Schmidt's work. Textual critics appear to have restricted themselves to a rehearsal of the book's well-known conclusions. Further inquiry was considered unnecessary, and Schmidt's textual foundation quickly ossified into orthodoxy. Belief was sufficient. The dangers of such uncritical trust are obvious. Not only are researchers deprived of a detailed record of the warrants, methods, and theories and material that make such a work possible, but the discipline is also left without an obvious standard or measure against which to review further text critical progress. The availability of the work in German has made little difference. The expectation that scholars would access it never translated into a comprehensive understanding of the work. The truncated history of the apocalypse's textual research makes this abundantly clear. The 21st century has rendered the need for an English translation of Schmidt's Studien all the more pressing. 
The field has experienced seismic changes in the years since the book's publication. The discovery of new manuscripts, the rise of the digital humanities, and continued refinements in text critical theory and perspectives have ushered in a new era. Textual critics thus face a fully transformed landscape today. The digital humanities, for example, now furnish new and improved images for paleographical and codicological observation. They deliver a number of digitization projects and produce a steady stream of electronic collations with exacting accuracy. And the advances, fast and furious as they are, easily overwhelm the senses and can distract from the equally important task of understanding the implications of such massive changes. The circumstances thus warrant a return to the history of the discipline, and Schmidt's Studien offers an opportunity to do just that. Fortunately, the text of the apocalypse has now begun to reap the benefits of the aforementioned advances. The newly developed tools and approaches to textual criticism were initially applied almost exclusively to New Testament books other than the Apocalypse, such as the Pauline letters, the Gospels, or the so-called Catholic epistles. The problem with that, of course, is that text-critical approaches applied to books other than the Apocalypse produce limited yields for the Apocalypse. In other words, what works for one textual tradition may not work for another. The new tools would have to test their mettle on the Apocalypse itself. Today, however, a steady stream of articles and monographs is beginning to address the imbalance. Most, though not all, are associated with the production of a new critical edition of the Apocalypse for the Editio Critica Maior, or the ECM. The ECM itself is an international multi-generational project that is reconstructing the entire Greek New Testament, book by book, with state-of-the-art technology. The project will also furnish an apparatus with a comprehensive review or record of textual changes through the first millennium for each New Testament book. Several volumes have already appeared with their findings available for peer review. The availability and proliferation of such research, however, is precisely the reason for another look at Schmidt's Studien. A comprehensive review of the history of research can clarify the warrants, progress, and direction of projects currently underway. Without such a review, the production of a critical edition, any critical edition, could easily be constructed ex nihilo, out of nothing, unmoored from the history of textual research, unaccountable to prior advances, and vulnerable to text critical myopia. A return to the history of research can justify our ongoing projects and contextualize their production. Of course, it could be argued that Schmid's Studien is condemned to obsolescence. After all, it was published in 1955. And the advances in the field have only served to cast the work's shortcomings into bold relief. Misread data, paleographical and codicological inadequacies, the lack of terminological clarity and questionable assumptions and judgments alongside other errors threaten to hamper the work's usefulness. The fact that some manuscripts were unknown or unexamined by Schmidt only exacerbates matters further. Schmidt's Studien could therefore be dismissed as an unreliable exemplar of antiquated research. The work's undeniable need for revision, however, is not a warrant for its wholesale dismissal. A dismissal would overlook what is irreplaceable about Schmidt's magnum opus. At the top of the list is the fact that Schmidt's Studien is the only work to date to offer a comprehensive review of the apocalypse's textual research from its earliest beginnings to 1955. And strikingly, not a single text critical commentary or manual today has seriously engaged, let alone superseded, the substance of Schmidt's historical review. This includes New Testament handbooks on textual criticism and major commentaries on the work. Schmidt's broad and comprehensive review of the history of textual research thus remains unmatched even to this day. And the greatest value, perhaps, lies in the fact that Schmidt's historical review is not mere reportage. Schmidt rather offers a critical assessment of every major work that precedes his own. Schmidt's wide-ranging review thus lays the groundwork for his own approach. His opus is a full participant in a complex, extensive, and wide-ranging conversation with the uppermost tier of textual critics in his day. Nowhere else will one find as thorough a scrutiny of trailblazers such as Westcott and Hort, Bernard Weiss, Wilhelm Busset, Hermann von Soden, and H.C. Hoskier, just to name a few. 
The fact that most of the works reviewed by Schmidt still exist only in German further increases the value of an English translation. Generations of sequestered and overlooked text-critical conversations would instantly become accessible to a broader audience. The boon to textual knowledge cannot be overstated. The translation of Schmidt's Studien thus offers us a unique opportunity to recover a forgotten chapter in the history of textual scholarship and witness the remarkable achievement represented by Schmidt's landmark work, a work that took 25 years to complete. To appreciate the scope of Schmidt's contribution, of course, we must begin where he began, looking back over the centuries of textual study and drawing an inventory of prior text critical advances. These will provide a roadmap to his current location as a textual scholar and a perch from which to look out over the horizon. There were a number of key figures to consider, pioneers who actually made his work possible. There was Erasmus, for example, who in the 16th century and for the first time ever offered a non-Latin textual basis for the apocalypse with a single Greek manuscript, the so-called Codex Reuchlin, a fraught manuscript to be sure, rashly copied and marred by textual corruption, and also the basis for the Textus Receptus, but nonetheless a significant break from the Latin. There was Karl Lachmann, who in the early 19th century broke with the received text and by extension, Codex Reuchlin. Lachman would reconstruct his Greek text of the Apocalypse using Codex Alexandrinus, a manuscript known since the 17th century but never used to restore the text. Lachman would also resist the urge to call his text the original, settling instead for a fourth century approximation. There was also Tischendorf, who in the 19th century transcribed Codex Ephraimi, a nearly indecipherable fifth century palimpsest that is, a reused manuscript whose initial writing had been erased. Tischendorf also notoriously recovered the 4th century Codex Sinaiticus, the earliest and most famous manuscript to preserve the entire Greek Bible. Codex Ephraimi, along with Alexandrinus, were considered the Apocalypse's most reliable witnesses by Tischendorf, except where a bias for Codex Sinaiticus clouded his judgment. Tischendorf was also responsible for recovering two additional manuscripts that would prove instrumental in tracking the evolution of the Apocalypse's textual history into the later periods. The 9th century Codex Porphyrianus, another palimpsest, and the 10th century Greek Codex Vaticanus, not to be confused with the 4th century manuscript bearing a similar name. There was also Westcott and Hort, who late in the 19th century would abandon any reluctance to call their reconstructed text the original. Much like Tischendorf, Westcott and Hort considered Alexandrinus and Ephraimi the most reliable witnesses for the apocalypse, but they relegated Sinaiticus to the status of an ancient but unreliable witness. For Westcott and Hort, Alexandrinus and Ephraimi alone preserved a pure textual stream that flowed directly from the pen of John. Then there was Bernard Weiss, who would be the first to identify two major textual traditions for the apocalypse, an unrevised earlier textual tradition and a heavily corrected later one. The codices Alexandrinus, Ephraimi, and Sinaiticus together represented an early unedited textual tradition, while Porphyrianus and the Greek Codex Vaticanus represented a later corrected one. These so-called corrected traditions would come to be known as recensions. And then there was Wilhelm Busset, who would follow Weiss and subject his pioneering work to a thorough re-examination. Bousset had accepted Weiss's distinction between an earlier and later tradition, but he disputed the notion that a common foundation was to be found between the two later manuscripts. Bousset rather argued that these two manuscripts represented two independent recensions, that is, two heavily corrected traditions that ran parallel to each other. Weiss's two traditions thus became three with Wilhelm Bousset. Bousset also was the first textual scholar to identify and reconstruct the Andreas archetype, a textual tradition that linked uh, the textual tradition linked to the seventh century commentary of Andrew of Caesarea. The Andreas archetype was one of the two later recensions identified by Bousset. The other was the Koine. Both remain in usage to this day. The identification of recensions, again, heavily corrected textual traditions, would appear to have reached its saturation point in the work of Hermann von Sauden, who at the dawn of the 20th century divided the entire manuscript tradition into three distinct groups or recensions, 
Each of these was dated to the fourth century. Each hailed from a different provenance, and each was edited by known ecclesiastical figures, whether Hezekius, Eusebius, Origen, Pamphilus, or Lucian of Antioch. The purpose of von Sodden's extensive effort was to identify the second or third century text of the apocalypse, and in the best case scenario, the actual original. So whenever the three recensions were in agreement, von Sodden was confident that the original had been found. On the other hand, disagreements or independent readings among the recensions were evidence of textual corruption. And finally, there was H.C. Hoskier, who in the first half of the 20th century offered the most comprehensive collection of manuscript data for the Greek text of the apocalypse. Hoskier's work would surpass that of Tischendorf and von Sodden in breadth, scope, accuracy, and detail. He would also abandon von Sodden's recensional theories as well as Hort's notion of text types. His own theories, however, would prove wildly implausible and never found any adherence. His collations, however, remain an indispensable resource for the Apocalypse's manuscript tradition to this day. The exhaustive inventory of prior textual scholarship produced by Schmidt, of which our survey is but a fraction, clarifies what questions remained for an examination of the book's textual history in the first half of the 20th century. Schmidt therefore articulated six research goals, each of which emerges from his review of the history of textual study. The first was to ascertain with greater clarity the characteristics of the Andreas and Koine recensions. Bousset, as has been noted, identified and reconstructed the Andreas archetype. Advances in theory and method, however, as well as the recovery of additional manuscripts, called for a reappraisal of their defining characteristics. The second was to reassess and investigate more thoroughly the relationship between the Andreas and Koine recensions, as well as that of all the other major text forms. Again, the labors of Weiss and Bousset prove essential here and are extended even further by Schmidt. The third was to examine the correspondence between the text of the Apocalypse in P47, a recently discovered third century papyrus in Schmidt's day, and the fourth century Codex Sinaiticus. The investigation would be undertaken opposite Alexandrinus and Ephraim on the one hand and the Andreas and Koine recensions on the other. The goal was to determine the coherence of the P47S text form against the backdrop of all three others. The fourth was to examine the status of Alexandrinus and Ephraim as witnesses to the neutral text of the Apocalypse. As noted, Hort had asserted that these two manuscripts bore witness to a pure textual stream that descended directly from the original a text Hort had labeled the neutral text. Schmidt would now set out to test that claim. The fifth was to examine the foundation of the Andreas and Koine traditions against all the other text forms of the apocalypse. Both Weiss and Bousset had differed on whether and to what extent the two recensions shared a common foundation. Schmidt would now re-examine that question as well. And the sixth and final goal was to study the author's linguistic style as a cross-check to his reconstruction of the Greek textual tradition. The question here was whether the language of John would confirm Schmidt's textual judgments about the transmission history of the apocalypse. The landmark work, as already noted, took a quarter of a century to complete, with Schmidt availing himself of and representing the state of the art in textual criticism as practiced between 1930 and 1955. During this period, Schmidt also produced a number of breakthrough articles that showcased the yields of his ongoing research. At its culmination, Schmidt summarized his work with eight conclusions. Eight conclusions that would remain the established and unchallenged reconstruction of the apocalypse's textual tradition for the next 60 years. The first was that the entire Greek tradition can be divided into four major text forms. AC, or Alexandrinus Nephraimi, P47S, or P47 and Sinaiticus, and the Andreas and Koine recensions respectively. There were thus four established text forms for the apocalypse. The second was that the Andreas and Koine recensions are entirely distinct from one another, a conclusion warranted by their unique readings. The third was that the Andreas and Koine recensions, though distinct, are not entirely independent of one another. A common foundation exists, albeit a far from extensive one. The fourth was that the AC and P47S text forms each represent the older text of the apocalypse. The fifth was that the AC text form surpasses that of all other text forms in value and stands closer to the original than any other, 
The sixth was that the text form, that each text form preserves the original in one place or another, irrespective of whether the tradition is early or late. The seventh was that the number of differences between A and C, as well as P47 and S, demonstrate that the relationship among the older text forms cannot be determined completely or arranged in a stemma, that is a diagram or a family tree that illustrates how the two text forms relate to each other and descend from a common ancestor. The four major text forms, however, all exist in the fourth century, an echo of von Sodden's chronological threshold of his own recensions. And the eighth and final conclusion was that Codex Alexandrinus remains the undisputed and most important witness for the Apocalypse's textual tradition, a judgment that confirms and extends further the prior assessments of Westcott and Hort, Bernard Weiss, and Wilhelm Busset. And with respect to the author's linguistic style, Schmidt concluded that John's stereotypical phrasing and idiosyncratic grammar confirmed the outstanding value of the AC text form. Schmidt also doubted whether any future studies could ever remove lingering doubts about the wording of the apocalypse. He even claimed that its text, on the whole, could no longer be regarded as extremely uncertain or very poorly transmitted. His work, he felt, had demonstrated otherwise, a claim that would stand for 60 years. These conclusions are well known in the literature. They are, however, seldom discussed in any depth. Only the first conclusion, the idea that the apocalypse's textual tradition can be divided into four major text forms, garners any attention. Everything else appears to be taken on trust, and there is certainly no examination of the theory that supports Schmidt's work. The theory and method that guide Schmidt's textual practices, in fact, are never stated outright. The results emerge almost as if fully formed from the work itself. Whatever theoretical framework suppo supports Schmidt's study must be deduced from the finished product. Scholars must therefore examine his review of textual research, his observations on the basis of empirical evidence, and his study of the apocalypse's language in order to gain a foothold into his thinking. Apart from these, there is no discussion of theory in his work. No critical reconstruction, however, occurs in a vacuum. Every project, irrespective of its empirical grounding, is informed by a shared set of cultural expectations and established norms. Schmidt's Studien is no exception. A web of common assumptions and shared cultural cues binds his study to that of others. The disclosure of that web then becomes the first order of business. A disclosure can clarify what is otherwise unclear about Schmidt's thinking, or the degree to which his thinking departs, even in a pioneering way, from that of his predecessors. That the Studien is a pioneering work is without question. The seeding of text critical ground to it for over six decades substantiates the claim. But the work is innovative in a way that has seldom, if ever, been recognized, even by those who have extensively worked with it. To put it simply, the Studien is groundbreaking not merely in its eight well-known conclusions, but also in its status as a transitional project that begins to break free from the classical way of doing textual criticism and toward one that has yet to be fully articulated. In text critical terms, Schmidt's Studien appears to move us from the confident reconstruction of what he would call a recensio to a more tentatively re reconstructed one. And I'll explain what I mean. The Studien here and there appears to bear the hallmarks of a Lachmanian or Massian approach to textual criticism. Classicists, such as Karl Lachmann and Paul Maas, reconstructed their texts on the assumption of an uncontaminated and closed textual tradition. The advantage of a closed textual tradition is that it facilitates the construction of a stemma, or a family tree of manuscripts, a stemma that serves to illustrate descent from a common ancestor or archetype. Schmidt appears to have begun with just such a method. He soon finds himself, however, facing a very different textual situation with the apocalypse. Unlike what is assumed in the classical approach, the apocalypse's textual tradition appeared to be an open one, displaying pervasive signs of contamination. Tracking the origin of copying errors was thus far from a simple matter, and the creation of, of a stemma of manuscripts was a questionable venture. The studien thus finds itself becoming untethered from the classical approach as it wades into the turbulent textual tradition 
of the apocalypse. At the start, however, the procedure of the studien matches that of other classical approaches. It is assumed, for example, that there are no autographs or copies that have been collated against the originals. The textual critic must therefore reconstruct the constitutio textus, that is, the text as close to the original as possible. Three tasks are necessary for this. First, there is the recensio, which attempts to establish what has been transmitted. Second, there is the examinatio, which examines the tradition and considers whether it offers access to the original. And third, there is the divinatio, which reconstructs the tradition by conjecture or by isolating textual corruption within that tradition. Of the three, recensio is the only term to surface explicitly in Schmidt's work, although he clearly executes all three. And consistent with the recensio phase, Schmidt eliminates any witnesses that depend exclusively on surviving exemplars, that is, manuscripts that are simply copies of known copies. These are redundant and of no independent value for reconstruction. The elimination of these manuscripts is part of the eliminatio codicum descriptorum, another hallmark of the classical approach. Schmidt's recensio, however, appears to offer mixed results. Most notably, he foregoes an opportunity to create a stemma of manuscripts that showcases their varied descent from a common ancestor. The complexity of the apocalypse's textual tradition simply will not allow it. The confident reconstruction of a stemma requires at least two assumptions in the classical approach, neither of which could be held with the apocalypse. First, that no contamination has taken place. That is to say that no scribe has combined several exemplars in his transcription of the apocalypse. Second, that each scribe deviates from his exemplar, whether consciously or unconsciously. The two assumptions facilitate the creation of a stemma that A, demonstrates the interrelationship of all surviving witnesses, B, allows for the reconstruction of the archetype, and C, allows for the restoration of the text of the archetype to a point where there are no more than two variants from which to choose. In the apocalypse, however, the presence of contamination derails Schmidt's project away from the assured results of the classical approach. And although there is no explicit discussion of contamination per se, this is what Schmidt means when he speaks of mixture in the tradition. Schmidt goes so far as to disavow the possibility of producing a stemma. He concludes his review by categorically stating that it is not possible to establish the mutual relationships of the apocalypse's old major text forms and to completely and accurately classify them together in a single stemma. In other words, it was not simply a stemma of manuscripts that was impossible, but even more broadly, a stemma of the older text forms, AC and P47S, which are tested in many manuscripts. There were a handful of exceptions, of course. Some parts of the tradition are represented by stemata, most notably a few manuscripts within the Andreas and Koine recensions. In fact, Schmidt is so confident about his reconstruction of the Andreas and Koine archetypes that he goes so far as to say that he knows how these archetypes actually read. But this is a far cry from creating a stemma for the entire textual tradition. And as noted, there are no such claims made for the archetypes of the older text forms AC and P47S. Only broad sketches and approximations of their trajectory are possible. The classical model has thus been taken to its limits by Schmidt and showcases by trial and error the kind of highly contaminated textual tradition that is widely recognized within the manuscript tradition today. Further, by abandoning the reconstruction of stemma, Schmidt appears to have paved the way for an alternative approach to the problem of contamination, even if he failed to provide an adequate solution for it. The stage is therefore set for newer approaches to the problems disclosed by Schmidt's work. One approach that is currently in vogue today is the application of the coherence-based genealogical method, or the CBGM. The method was developed specifically to deal with a highly contaminated textual tradition and promises to offer a new and innovative solution to the problem of contamination. The classical stemma of manuscripts, already partially abandoned by Schmidt, are replaced by computer-generated local stemmata at the level of variation units. The method also creates a global stem of text in a manuscript tradition. Texts, rather than manuscripts, are linked in order to trace the lineage of textual variants back to the Ausgangstext or the initial text. <clears throat> 
The method itself is purely text genetic and examines textual relationships apart from their physical trappings. And as noted, it presupposes an open and contaminated textual tradition, the very thing Schmidt encountered in 1955. The CBGM thus begins where Schmidt ended and presupposes what Schmidt had found. The promise of the new method of courts awaits full disclosure. The challenges of the apocalypse's textual tradition are unlike those of other books. The method itself has undergone refinements in its engagement with different textual traditions, and some have even noted a bias in its method. Improvements to the CBGM must therefore run their full course. The introduction of a new method for examining the apocalypse's textual tradition, however, is much welcome. More approaches, not fewer, are necessary. And the battery of newer methods, coupled with the translation of Schmidt's landmark work into English, promises to broaden text-critical conversations and recontextualize trends in a period of concentrated and accelerated research. The recently accessible classic study by Schmidt thus holds out the promise that a long-standing gap in textual scholarship, a gap that has persisted for over six decades, will finally be closed. Thank you. Thank you.